everybody. Um, good to see everybody this morning. Uh, just a couple of things we want to uh, get uh, call your attention to before we uh, start our music. Um, in addition to our Sunday morning services here and our serving opportunities here, we also uh, offer uh, some other opportunities to grow and learn and expand and so forth. One of those is the Leadership Summit. You've heard me talk about that off and on for the last few years. Uh, it, it originates in Chicago at the Willow Creek campus and is broadcast all over the world. Uh, the, one of the, the location for us has become Eau Claire, which is very convenient. It's right in our backyard. It makes it easy to attend the summit. And uh, I you know, try to encourage everybody each year to, to give it a try at least once because it's, it's, it's a very stirring experience and uh, an experience that God can speak to you and point you in a direction uh, of His will. And so, to kind of encourage you in that direction this morning, I've asked Roger, um, oh my goodness, Morris. My brain, my brain. Okay, I'm sorry. Roger Morris is going to share his, his experience with you of this past year's summer. Well, kind of, anyway. Let me read a little bit of scripture for you. Matthew 5, 13. Neither do people light a lamp but put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. You all know that one, Matthew 5.15. And he said to them, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men, Matthew 4.19. When I was a little tiny kid, I was so shy that if I saw somebody walking down the street, and I was supposed to know who they were, I'd go to the other side of the street so I wouldn't have to talk to them. Because it's scary talking to people, especially up front. But God has called us to lead. In some place in your life, every single one of us leads. Whether it's in your household, whether it's with your children, whether it's with your grandparents, whether it's in school or at work, some place. We're called to be leaders. And this country is in trouble because as Christians, we have to do a very good job. But the task is, well, all right, I can lead. How in the world do you do that? What does that mean? I've got some more things to read. <laughs> when you get human potential untapped, motivated to achieve a worthy purpose, everything truly is possible. That's Carly Fiorina, who's the CEO of Hewlett Packard. She was one of the people we got to listen to. If you feel frustrated, limited in your potential, your relationship isn't where you know it could be, stop and ask. What is the crucial conversation we are either not holding or not holding well? That's Joseph Grenning, co-founder of Vitasmarts, a social scientist for business performance. My company will not be more truthful or more graceful than I am. I am the constraint on our company. That's Don Flo, chairman and CEO of Flow Companies Incorporated. We got to hear him too. Leadership is this intense journey into yourself how much you're willing to learn, how much you're willing to give. Jeffrey Amell, CEO of General Electric. You gotta take these steps sometimes into the unknown. Life is short, but God is big. You big him. That you've heard of him already. And once the moral condition of your community has been revealed to you, we must move to action. That's Wilfredo de Jesus, senior pastor of the New Life Covenant Church, times 100 most influential people of 2013. Mm -hmm. We're all of us called to be leaders. We got to listen to these people talking about their roles as leaders. And we learned a lot. It was sort of like hitting a buzz saw. There's all this information coming at you. It was really fun. There was food, too. <laughs> it was really worthwhile, and I encourage each and every one of you to come with us this coming August. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Roger. Um, and uh, just a reminder, the in-conference rate for next year's Leadership Summit, which is $139, is available for two more days through October 28th. That is Tuesday. So if you want to sign up for that rate, please give me a call today or tomorrow. Okay? Um, financial reports. Uh, we, the, the finance team puts out a financial report quarterly on the budget and how the budget is doing and so forth and expenditures. 
And uh, those are available on the back table. I, uh, sometimes they're, they're back there, they're available, but I don't think we call it attention to them enough. And so I want to make you aware that they're back there. If you're interested in that, if you're uh, uh, concerned about that, you want to know how we're doing for our budget for this year, the reports from the finance team are on the rear table. Okay? Now, now that I've said that, Dan, we might need some more copies. So. Okay. okay. Um, all right, we're going to sing some songs together. Chapter 7 of the story is ready to go. Uh, let's pray together, and we'll turn it over to the, the team. God, today we are looking at a passage of Scripture that there's so many, there's a big story, but there's so many sub-stories. Uh, we could go a lot of different directions. But we're seeing, we see in this story courage and faith to rise to a big challenge and take this promised land, which has been promised now for hundreds of years. And so today, today may we be inspired by Joshua and his leadership and the faith of the Israelites. And God, um, just as we, as we talk to you about this morning from the platform and our team, sometimes we feel like we're not worthy of such things. We're not worthy of conquest in your name. We can't do a whole lot because we're flawed and we're limited and we have shortcomings and we're human and we have our sins and we have our issues. And so often we don't feel worthy. We understand that you're God and you can't be trifled with. You're holy, you're overpowering. You're sovereign, you're almighty. Well, may we also know today that you are tender and gracious and merciful. And that all those shortcomings have been nailed to a cross. That we might be able to step forward bold in your strength. That we might be able to step forward and be truthful, honest, loving people. So regardless of where we are today, whether we've heard this story a hundred times, or whether we're just, we're just entering this for the first time, or maybe new, or maybe we're seeing things we've never seen before. Would you invade us today? Change us. Inspire us. Have your way with us. Send us forward with your purpose, your agenda, and your mission. <coughs> May our worship be acceptable in your sight this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand up? Praises to God.
promised never to leave or forsake us. But he is still holy and majestic and inaccessible but for his incredible grace. And I just get overwhelmed with that. Sometimes we forget how mighty, how majestic, and how inaccessible he is but for his grace.
morning. morning. When you pray, you should go into your room and close the door and pray to your Father who cannot be seen. Your Father can see what is done in secret, and He will reward you, Matthew 6 and 6. Call to me, and I will answer you. I'll tell you marvelous and wondrous things that you could never figure out on your own. Jeremiah 33 and 3. In the time of Jesus, every Jewish home had a place for private devotion. It was a place where the door could be closed on distractions and interruptions. And such a place was often a small room built on a flat roof. People went there to draw close to God. Sometimes it was a modest space raised in a story above the rest of the house, where people retired to nourish their souls in the reality and certainty of God. Really, when you think of it, we probably all have such a place, don't we, where we can draw close to God. It is wherever we can go to be with God in a way that we are unable to do anywhere else. You know, the place isn't important. It is what happens there that's important. And it's whatever place works for you. I know several people whose quiet place is the bathroom. In their busy households, early mornings or late at night, they can lock the door and have their solitude. They even keep their devotional materials there and Bibles there. For others, it is windshield time. They're driving to work. And I said, as I said, the place isn't important. What happens there is. Again, it's whatever place works for you to get close to God. What is important is the attitude we bring with us to our special place. You know, not too long ago I discovered that my quiet time wasn't what it used to be. It wasn't as meaningful to me as it once was. I was distracted more often, a little more foggy and groggy in the mornings than even was normal for me. It had become like a chore. I didn't like the way it was going. I didn't like the way I was feeling. You know, so I, I prayed about it. And in the, in the discipleship class the elders are involved in, I discovered something. And I discovered my prayers were answered. In the readings in class, I discovered what my trouble was, what my errors in thinking were. I had been thinking of my morning quiet time, of Bible study and prayer, as a means for my own spiritual growth. Now this is true. It is a time for my own spiritual growth, but I had forgotten that this time means something to the Lord God Almighty as well. I remember that he loved me, and at great cost he redeemed me. And I know through his word that he values me and our fellowship, and he looks forward to the quiet time that we have together. He likes it when I look up into his face during our time together. <clears throat> When I look up into his face in awe, in humility, worship, wonder, praise, and love, and I feel his joy. I've said this many times before, and you've all heard it from me, I think, but I believe when we are obedient, when we come to meet him in true praise, in true fellowship, he does a fist pump and he says yes as any parent might do. The truth that Christ wants my fellowship, that he loves me and wants me to be with him, 
and waits for me each morning has changed the significance of my quiet time. I look forward to my communion with him each morning, and I feel his joy. I am excited about what will happen when we meet. I know that my time with God will be rich and fruitful. He promises that. And he's excited about that too. As we come to the Lord's table this morning, let us come with that attitude in mind. Knowing that he wants our fellowship that he loves us and waits for us to be with him and waits for us at his table. And when we come to his table with a right heart, he will pump his fist and say yes. And we will feel his joy. Remember, he has redeemed us at a great cost. Would you bow with me, please? Dearest Heavenly Father, help us, O oh Lord, to shut out anything that would take your place in our hearts and minds. Thank you for your love and for inviting us to be part of your family. We praise you for being our provider, our defender, and sustainer. And we remember the price you paid for our redemption. In Jesus' name we pray.
Heavenly Father, it's an honor to walk with you. The treasure that we have in knowing you and the stewardship that we represent here. We just ask your blessing on us. This is your story, this is my story. <coughs> Most of all, this is the greatest story ever told. This is God's story. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses is aid. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them. To the Israelites, I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river of the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give to them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Kids age 3 through 10, volunteers to Smith for Children's Church. And for those under 3, we do have the family room option, west end of the lobby. There's a new monitor in there that's bigger. You can actually see what's happening in there. And that's on. I did check it, double check it this morning, so that's an option as well. Um, thanks to our servers this morning. Thanks for our worship team who gets up early Sunday morning, gets here to warm up and make sure that. You know, there's no distractions for worship, and for our volunteers in the booth, and for our servers this morning, thank you guys so much. Uh, we're going to start in Joshua chapter 1 this morning, where the video was reading from, so if you want to have your Bibles and you want to turn there, follow along, we're going to start right there in the first part of Joshua in the Old Testament. You know, it takes uncommon courage to face an enemy. It takes uncommon courage to face an obstacle, or a challenge, or a tough assignment. And uh, when you have that situation, you're facing an enemy or an obstacle, there's almost always fear involved. And there's probably no greater example, there's a lot of examples we could talk about, but there's probably no other greater or such challenge than when the Allies went ashore in Normandy, June 6, 1944, D-Day. Maybe you've heard the stories of that, or maybe you could imagine the fear that went through the hearts of the Allied troops as they stormed the beaches of the northern coast of France. <coughs> And right before the Normandy landings, General George Patton gave one of his famous speeches to the Third Army. I'm going to put a portion of it on the screen here and read it to you. And this is, by the way, is edited from its original version because General Patton was, didn't believe in sacred language. <laughs> okay, this is what he said. I don't want any messages saying I'm holding my position. We are not holding a thing. We're advancing constantly and we're not interested in holding anything. Our plan of operation is to advance and keep on advancing, but we have to go over or through the enemy. Now, General Patton, maybe you know or familiar with his story, he was one of the major leaders in the war in Europe in World War II. And with this speech, he wanted to encourage his troops to keep moving forward. And he knew the Allies could win. But he also knew it was going to be a fight. We've been in the series called The Story, and this is God's story divided into 31 chapters. We found there's an upper story, God's plan, God's agenda, what he's doing, and there's a lower story, the reality that we find ourselves living in, and we're often caught up in the lower story. 
And yet when we view our life from the perspective of the upper story, pain and suffering and difficulty begins to make sense. And we can find purpose in our life. And we can find our story within the story of God. And early in history, God set out to build a nation of people through whom he would reveal himself to the world. And so he started with one man named Abraham. And over time, Abraham's family became a nation that wound up in slavery in Egypt, and God delivered them in epic fashion and led them into the Sinai Desert where he taught them to trust in him, which was a painful exercise for a lot of them. And last week, we found them wandering in that desert for 40 years. So today, we pick up the story at the point where the Israelis now are standing on the east bank of the Jordan River. The 40 years is done. Moses is gone. He's died. He's passed away. And his assistant, Joshua, has taken over the leadership of Israel. And Joshua now hears from the Lord. Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. It says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses 8, verse 2. No, verse 2 is up there. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, the Israelites. Verse 3. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, to the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the great sea on the west. And so it doesn't say what Joshua was responding to this, but I'm sort of thinking in Joshua's mind, I might have been in Joshua's shoes, I was thinking, whew, so God's going to give us the land. Awesome. <laughs> At least things at last, things will go a little bit easier. And verse 5. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I would, was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Wait, wait, God. Wait, wait. Stand up against us? What do you mean? You mean some are going to try to stand up against us? Verse 6. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Wait, wait, you said you're going to give them. Why are you saying, I'll never leave you, forsake you? Okay, why are you saying this strong and be courageous thing? Verse 7. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right, to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. So God was going to give Israel the land. So why was he talking about courage? Here's why. Because it would be a fight. The land of Canaan, God had promised his people, had God had promised his Abraham, wasn't an empty campground where there was running of the water, spigots over there, the bathrooms over there, the, you know, there's plenty of space to pitch your tents. Move on in. That wasn't the, what Canaan looked like. It was occupied. People lived there. Pagan people lived there. And they weren't exactly to just turn over the land to Israel because they, the Israel marched in and says, oh, this is our land, God's given us this land. They weren't going to say, well, sure, here's the deed. Move on in. We'll find someplace else to live. That just wasn't going to happen. And God says to them, you're going to win because I'm with you. I'm going to give you capacity to overcome these people living in this land. And yeah, it's going to be a fight. So, be strong and courageous. I will be with you. Now, you know what's interesting about this part of the story is what we don't see here. Because since the Israelis left Egypt, there was all kinds of what? Complaining. There's no water. There's no food. We're in a bad place. You brought us out here to die. You know, we can't take the land. They're too big. We're too, you know, they're, we're too small and they're too big and they're too mean and we're too bad. You know, we should have stayed in Egypt. We should get a new leader and go back to Egypt now. There's plenty of food back there. And we saw last week that attitude, that lack of faith, caused this generation of privilege of settling in the land that was promised to Abraham. And God, in effect, had said to them, okay, you said I brought you out here in the desert to die. Have it your way. And apparently, that generation that, leveled, that was leveled that consequence for their lack of faith, apparently that generation of Israeli people used that 40 years wisely. And apparently, around the campfires, uh, night after night after night, out in the desert, 
These people told the story to their children and to their grandchildren and to their nieces and nephews. And they said, you know what? There's going to be another chance to go into that promised land. And when you get that chance, don't hesitate. It might seem daunting. It might seem scary. What God says may make no sense, but I'm telling you, just do it. Because we don't want you to make the same mistake we did. We're never going to see the promised land. We're going to die out here. Don't you guys make the same mistake. And that's not in the text. I'm just imagining that. But apparently, the lesson was learned. And so Joshua took God's marching orders to the Israelis. Skip down to verse 10. Joshua 1.10. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your supplies ready. Three days from now, you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. Okay, folks. Time's come. Pack it up. <coughs> Lock and load. We're going in. Skip down to verse 16. Then they, look at this. Then they answered Joshua, whatever you have commanded us, we will do. Mm. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we fully, in parentheses, once obeyed Moses, Moses so we will obey you. <clears throat> There's not a hint of complaining here. There's not a hint of rebellion. There's not a trace of second guessing. You know, oh, you brought us out here to die. There wasn't any of that. It was, yes, sir, we're going in. If there was complaining, it's not recorded. And apparently this generation learned the lesson of the past, and they were ready, and they were poised, and they were eager to go. And now we hear that collective trust in God from all the people that we only heard from a few previously. And the first obstacle now is the Jordan River. They need to get past the Jordan River, and it's, it, you know, we don't have bridges. We don't even think about crossing the river now because we have bridges that are so wide we can put up a bridge in a few days. That time it took months, and uh, they didn't have months. And if they stopped uh, long enough to build a bridge, they would have made them vulnerable to enemies. And so God intervened with them miraculously, piled up the water miles upstream, and they walked across the river and died dry ground. There was no hesitation. There was no protest. The next obstacle was a city called Jericho. And Jericho was a major city in Canaan and it had been there for hundreds of years. It was in a very fertile agriculture location. It was a long major trade route and like many cities at that time, was fortified. In other words, it had a huge protective stone wall all the way around it. Some think that Jericho had two walls. And to conquer a city in ancient times was a major, costly undertaking. Because it meant you had to do what was called a siege. In other words, you surrounded that city for months and cut off their supplies until they starved to death and they died from water. And you're going to outlast them. Well, huh, I mean, that required supplies and that required endurance. And eventually the conquering army needed to find a way through the wall or over the wall. And so either you had to build a huge battering ram that, that took materials and skills, or you had to build a huge ram of, of earth and stone to get up to that wall, which was costly because you could be picked off with arrows as you built the ram. And by this time, word had reached Jericho of these Israelites and their god Yahweh. And he's, they're coming and their god is powerful. So the text says that Jericho was tightly shut up. No one was going in. No one was going out. This is a huge challenge for these Israelis. And God said, look, I'm going to give you Jericho. You won't have to build a siege. You won't have to build ramps and battering ramps. Just march around the city for six days with your trumpets blaring. And on the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the Ark of the Covenant in front and your trumpet's blaring, and at the end of the seventh time around, give a shout, and I'll drop the walls for you. And then you will take that city, leave no survivors, you will take no spoil. And there was no hesitation, and there was no complaining. And they did what God told Joshua to do, 
and the walls of Jericho fell. Here's a quote. I thought this was interesting. This is from the Jewish historian Josephus. He wrote this about that episode. I'll put this on the screen. While they were, that's they, they were the people of Jericho. They were affrighted at the surprising overthrow of the walls, and their courage was become useless. And they were not able to defend themselves. And so they were slain, some in the ways, the streets, and others as caught in their houses. Nothing afforded them assistance, but they perished even to the women and the children. Overwhelming victory. And so from that point on, the Israelites became an unstoppable force in Canaan. They were like the Chicago Bears in 1986. Do you remember that team? Some of you remember that team. Oh, no. you, know, you probably forgot that team, right? Richard Dent, Mike Singletary, Jim McMahon, The Fridge, Walter Payton, they were unstoppable. They were intimidating, they were bruising, and yes, it's a bygone era. Right? <laughs> but for one season, the Bears ran over everybody in the NFL. This was like, this was what the Israelites were like in Canaan. Here's a list of the recorded conquests and victories. These are cities and tribes. Um, scripture records these uh, over the cities and the tribes of Canaan. It was Jericho, Ai, or Ai, the Amorite Alliance. The Amorites, there was about five or six different cities and tribes that said, you know, we better gang up against these Israelites because they're strong and they've got a great God. So we, our only chance is to team up. They beat them too. It was Makeda, Libna, Lachish, Eglon, Hebron, Debir, or Debir, Anab, and the Northern Alliance, another a series of uh, tribes and, and cities ganged up upon them, they lost too, and Hazor. And time after time, as the Israelites faced these armies, God said, don't be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. And battle after battle after battle, the Israelites won the victory. And over a period of about seven or eight years, conquered most of Canaan and became established firmly enough in that land to live in peace. And the promised land became a reality. Now, what we don't have time for this morning is why the idea of war is associated with God's people and why God said exterminate the whole lot. Take no survivors. What? That seems kind of harsh. But we don't have time for that in this message. I, I encourage you to take that up in your group discussion. But so in the time we have left, I want to make some application from this story for us in the 21st century. I want to make three general statements, and then we'll talk about some specifics. Okay? Here's the first statement. The promised land for the church is community transformation to Christ's likeness. The promised land for us the local church, is to transform our community into Christ's likeness. See, the promised land for us is not heaven. Okay? I mean, it includes heaven. It's sort of someday by and by. But I heard this taught when I was a kid. If we'll just be faithful to God, one day we'll arrive on the shores of the promised land. Great. Didn't have much, you know, I, I didn't apply to that day very much. But that's what I was taught. And I would say, no, that's not, I don't think that's true. I mean, it's partly true, but it's not absolutely true. And the kingdom of God is not won by violence. I, did you, I hope you got a chance to meet my friend Greg, Greg Lumen. He was here back in June on Membership Sunday, and then he was here on the first day. We started the story with my former roommate, Mike, guys, tall guys, not much hair. Remember those guys? Hope you got a chance to meet him. Greg has a wonderful sense of humor. It just cracks me up. And uh, we're, we're sitting out at my place when they got here, and we're talking, and he looked at my, you know, antler racks on the wall, you know, my dear antler racks, my couple little ones. <laughs> and uh, so we're talking about that and how that relates to ministry. And Greg says, hi, I'm Don. I can save you, or I can kill you. <laughs> That's just Greg's um, sense of humor. But we're not going to get people in the kingdom of God by threatening them with death. Now, lost my place. Where am I? Sorry. Okay. We're not to threaten or scare people or force people into the kingdom of God, but inspire them by grace and truth in the spirit of Jesus. 
the promised land or the upper story for us, the church in the 21st century, is God revealed through us, through his church, to our community, which results in the expansion of the kingdom of God in our community and in the real estate of people's lives. That's the promised land for us. That's number one. Number two general statement, it's going to be a fight. It's going to be a fight. And I'm not saying this to discourage you, but just as a kind of a call to acceptance, can we just kind of know this up front? It's going to, it's going to be the same for all of us. It's not going to be easy. See, many of you know this to be true. You start moving in God's direction, and it starts to get tough. All of a sudden, the currents get tricky, and it gets a little difficult, and it gets a little hairy, right? I hear this in my small group all the time. Man, John, I sit down and read my Bible, and all hell breaks loose. You know? I mean, the kids start screaming, the phone starts ringing, the washing machine starts spewing stuff. I'm just, you know, I sit down to pray, and all hell breaks loose. Some of you experienced that. I'll just say this. Moving into enemy territory means a fight. Whether it's Canaan, whether it's Normandy, or whether it's the parts of people's lives that the devil owns. It's not going to just plop into our lap. It's going to be a fight. And even though Israel conquered Canaan, that doesn't mean none of the Israeli soldiers died. Some did, and there was mourning, and there was loss, and there was pain. God's people won the war, but it was a fight. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul said it this way. 1 Timothy 6.12, he said, Fight the good fight of the faith. So if it's a fight, then what? Well, okay. Basically, it comes down to two things we'll have to fight for. Number one is our own spiritual health, relationship with God, and our relationships with one another. That's what we're going to have to fight because as you will remember, the greatest commandment is exactly that, right? Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Is it any wonder those two things might be the battlefield? And see, we have, this happens to us all the time. It pulls on us all the time. The Bible kind of becomes hard to understand. It's hard to do consistently. You know, we kind of let it go. Things get difficult. We get discouraged. And or we get busy and our prayer life evaporates and suddenly God is light years away and we just sort of drop out, fade away, step out. Not for me. Or whether it's a marriage or a family or a ministry team, there's a disagreement, there's misunderstanding, there's conflict and somebody goes out the door. Maybe there wasn't a willingness to fight. Fight for our relationship with God. Fight for our relationships with others. Because just as Canaan was a fight, so will the kingdom of God be in the 21st century. Now I'm listening to my, my brother Mark up here. That's a great example. He was fighting for his relationship with God. It's a good example. That's the second statement. It'll be a fight. Here's the third. And I love this one. We have God's promise to succeed. We need to only be obedient. We have God's promise to succeed. All we have to do is obey Him. See, God told Israel, who was facing the giant of the conquest of Canaan, said, look, I'm giving you this land. I'm giving it to you. I'll be with you. I'm going to give you capacity you don't have. No one will be able to stand up to you. You know what? We have that same promise. Did you know that? In the New Testament, the promise sounds strikingly familiar. It's strikingly familiar. Here it is. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will build my assembly. I will build my gathering and nothing will be able to stand up to it. That's our promise, folks. And Israel conquered Canaan because they followed God's instructions. And you know what? We'll win Russ County to the kingdom of God when we become obedient to follow Jesus right here with how he leads right now. Okay, so the question is, okay, gotcha. Obedient to what? Okay, now let's talk about some specifics. God provided a pattern for success for the Israelis to which they surrendered almost flawlessly. This pattern applies to us too. Here it is. Number one, become people of the word. Become people of the word. Look at this verse. We'll read it again. This is the third time you've heard it today. 
Joshua 1.8, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. In other words, talk about it all the time. Meditate on it day and night. Think about it all the time. So that you may be able to careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be what? Prosperous and successful. Now, interesting. The law that he's talking about here to Joshua was the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Had just been written by Moses. It was the first part of the Bible. The written, recorded word of God. And it was brand new in the hearts of the Israelis. And God was saying to them, Okay, now, you just got this law. My written revelation of law. Talk about it all the time. Think about it all the time. And be careful to do what it says. Then, I will be with you will be a reality. And that was right before Jericho. And now, and right after the great victory of Ai, in the middle of the campaign, look at this, verse, uh, chapter 8, Joshua 8, verse 34. Joshua 8, 34. Afterward, this is after the victory of Ai, Joshua read all the words of the law, the blessings and the curses, just as it is written in the book of the law. Just to remind Israel... This is our foundation, guys. This is where we camp out on. This is our driving force. This is our strength. You know what? The point is this. We know this. It's so simple and sometimes so hard to carry out. The point, the truths and the teachings and the principles of the Word of God need to be our personal foundation, both as individuals and as a church. Now, about a week ago, there was a conversation... If, familiar with social media, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, all those things. Okay. There was a conversation on Facebook about a week ago about you know, this, this hot topic of gay marriage and gay rights, and homosexual, you know, that kind of thing, right? that whole conversation. Somebody posted something on there and the, the, the discussion began. And I jumped in on some of those. This one time I didn't. I just listened. I just read it as it unfolded. And one of my um, sisters-in-law from another state, she's very accomplished, she's very successful, she's very smart, she's an accomplished writer. And she's also very liberal and also very secular. She said, why don't you guys, in other words, Christians, why don't you guys come out from behind your Bible quotes and talk from your heart? And someone that I don't know answered that with what an answer that I thought was awesome. And it's worth putting on the screen. Here it is. That's what she said. My heart is God's heart. Good answer. That's where we need to be, folks. When the word of God and the truth of God becomes our center in our heart, when the word of God becomes our motivation, our driving force, our foundation, when we know it and obey it, then we'll be what? We'll be prosperous and successful. So number one, to become people of the word. Number two, plan for success, need to be obedient to, become people of prayer. People of prayer. I appreciate what Randy Frazee says about this in the story curriculum stuff. Some of you might uh, talk about this. He says that people of God need to be continually in prayer to see if God is in on their plans. And if he's in on it, we charge. And if he's not, we hold our position. But there's another application of this in Joshua chapter 10, which I believe is even more challenging. At the, at the time, Joshua led the armies of Israel against the Amorite alliance. And which, which, we, had, which had, we had this listed a few minutes ago as one of the conquests. The Amorite alliance was several cities, several tribes that teamed up against Israel. They heard that these Israelites were coming. Where our only chance is to be, become allies and team up against these guys. So come on. Let's, they send this the Amorite alliance. They sent thousands and thousands and thousands of troops. And Joshua led the Israel, uh, Israelite armies. They marched all night and surprised this Amorite alliance early in the morning, and they started to whoop them. They started to beat them back. And as the day wore on, Joshua could see that they needed more daylight, otherwise these Amorites were going to like gonna scatter and hide. They would lose the battle. They would lose them. They would get away from them. And so Joshua prayed an amazing prayer. 
Look at this, Joshua 10, verse 12. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, O oh, sun, stand still over Gibeon, O oh, moon, over the valley of Ishalom. And then look what happened, verse 29. Or, uh, yeah. um, 13. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Now, it's good to pray for our needs. It is. It's good to pray for those who are sick. It's good to pray for those who are experiencing pain and difficulty and loss. Absolutely. But can we get to the place where, pray, where we're play, praying audaciously and boldly and asking God for the impossible? Put a quote on the screen. This is, um, this is Oswald Chambers. Oswald Chambers wrote a, a masterpiece of a, a book of a devotional called My Utmost for His Highest. Some of you have used that. This is a quote from that, from that book. And this is convicting to me. It says, look how we limit the Lord by only remembering what we have allowed him to do for us in the past. We say, I've always failed there and I always will. Consequently, we don't ask for what we want. Instead, we think, oh, it's ridiculous to ask God to do this. But if it's an impossibility, it's the very thing for which we have to ask. God will do what is absolutely impossible. See, perhaps as a church, maybe we, get, maybe we need to get a little more strategic and a little more intentional about prayer. And maybe we need to call out to God with one voice. God, give us the hearts of the people of this community so your kingdom might expand and your people might reach the promised land in this neck of the woods. I think that we need to become people of prayer that goes beyond formality to audacity. So that's the second thing. And here's the third thing, third part of the success that we've called to obey, become people of integrity. In other words, we need to be completely obedient and compliant to God's instructions instead of mostly compliant. And I said it for a minute ago, I said Israel almost flawlessly surrendered to God's instructions. I said almost flawlessly. There's a reason I said that. See, when Israel conquered Jericho, there were specific <laughs> instructions. Do not, do not, do not keep any silver or gold or bronze or iron for yourselves. Do not keep any of that for yourselves. Put it in the treasury that is set aside for God's purposes. The, the, the instructions were very specific, very clear, very emphatic. And a man named Achan, when nobody was looking, he took some gold. Oh, what's, you know, there's so much of it. What's one piece? Josephus said he took a gold coat. And he put it in his tent. And he hid it in his tent. <coughs> and the next battle against Ai, Israel was defeated. Remember that story? Achan's disobedience cost Israel a victory over the city of Ai. And it cost dozens of Israeli lives. Here's the point. We need to have our lives completely turned over to God. Not mostly. Not partly. I don't mean being perfect. I don't mean being perfect people. I mean complete obedience to what God reveals us that we should do and not do. I mean, it, it, it's like we're, we can't take our cues from others around us. Well, I'm doing this, but everybody else is doing it, or they're doing it, and they're doing it, so what the heck? We can't do that. We have to take our cues from how the Spirit leads us. And it's... It's not about being, you know, it's not about legalism. It's not about pl not playing cards on Saturday night. If it's that, we just blew it last night with the international students. So, you know? It's not about just wearing long dresses 
It's not about using only the King James Version. It's not about that stuff. It's about quitting lying. It's about quit your gossiping. It means facing and dealing with our addictions of food and internet and pornography and substances. Rather than hiding them. Integrity means we're the, we're the same person out in the community that we are in church. It means we deal with our sin instead of sweeping it under the rug. Because if we don't, it hurts the cause. It hurts the mission. It compromises the power and strength of the church, which has been promised victory. Nothing will be able to stand up against it. You only need to be pure vessels. And you know what? These three things. When a group of God's people get that right, they become immersed in the Word of God. When they become people of bold of prayer and they quit justifying their stupid sin and leave it behind, there's a power that's turned loose that gets people's attention and draws them in. And nothing, nothing can stand up to them. And that was true in about 1400 B.C. in the Battle of Canaan. And it's true today for us in the 21st century. So, how you doing? Are you in the Word? Right, that's so simple, right? The formula for sex is success is so simple. It's not so complicated. It's so simple. Are you in the Word? Is the truth of God, the written word of God, your reality? Is the word of God your heart? I love that. Is it your foundation for life? Is it the force that drives you? Are we people of prayer? No, we pray. Sure, we pray. My wife, we want to sleep and come, Lord Jesus, be our guest and our Father who art in heaven. Yeah, well, we pray. But again, can we get past prayer as a formality to some audacity and become bold enough to ask God for the impossible, to ask him for capacities we don't have on our own, to ask God for the hearts of this community as we reach out to them? And thirdly, are there conversations you're avoiding? Are the choices you're avoiding, you're kind of sweeping it over here, you're hoping nobody will know, but hope it's not a big deal to God? Are you willing to abandon that area you're holding on to for the sake of the bigger thing? You know what? You just talk about us for a minute. Our church, in some ways, is on the banks of the Jordan River. Now, there's been a lot of good things that happened here in the past. Good things are happening right now as we speak. But at this point in time, at this point in our story, we have a momentum forward. Part of that is the hardest of talents. Part of that is impact. Part of that is a new form, reshaped Christmas musical outreach that we're going to do this year. And we have a brand new team, brand new ministry team working on outreach, a brand new team taking the gospel, working on taking the gospel to the dark corners of our community. And in the lower story, it will be a fight against the giants of apathy and entitlement and consumerism and the hostility in our culture and the resistance in our culture that says, oh, that religion, I ain't going to part of that. It'll be a fight against misunderstanding and conflict and disagreement. The lower story means those giants are bigger than God's people. But you know what? In the upper story, God's bigger than the giants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's promised his people a win if we'll just follow. Will you stand with me? Now, so I want to end. You know, we talked about the Leadership Summit, what we try to do, maybe we could do better with this, but what we try to do at the summit is say, okay, as you experience that 
What's one thing that God's sort of zeroing in on and tapping you on the shoulder about that he wants you to change or make a choice or make a directional change or course correction? What's that one thing that God's stirring your heart? Let's pray about it. And that's what I want to do this morning. As this the last 35 minutes or so as this message has unfolded, what's God sort of putting his finger on in your, in your life? I think there's things we can address as a church, like strategic prayer and um, those kinds of things, crucial conversations maybe that we're not having. But what is that that God's fingering in your life this morning? That might make the difference between a win and a failure for his church. And can we rise up audaciously, boldly, and say, you know what? That's covered. I'm leaving that behind. So let's pray together and bring those things to God. My God, gracious Father, <laughs> it never gets old to me. It just never gets old to me that you invite us into your kingdom. And despite our sin and our stubbornness and our selfishness and our ignorance, you pay that price for us. You call us sanctified. You put us in a place of no condemnation. And you call us friend. You call us your children. You call us your gathering, your assembly. You say nothing will be able to stand up to us. And God, you know, the formula for success, it's really kind of simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. We'll just be a people of your word. We'll just get into that and we'll just never give up until it becomes part of our heart. It becomes our heart. It becomes our leading force in our life. And that we'll pray and we'll not give up. And we'll pray boldly for what we don't have, for what, what the impossible seems to be. And then we're going to, Lord, we're going to forsake sin. It's just so simple. And so, God, whatever you're putting your finger on this morning for all of us standing in the auditorium, God, Lord, we take a step forward and we give this to you. And we ask your leadership and your guidance from this point forward. Let us leave dark things, lazy things, average things, maybe even good things behind for the sake of what's excellent. For the sake of what you're calling us to. May we all make that choice today. In Jesus' name. Everyone agreed and said it? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.